Well, the market is still smarting after the hardest April in history in so many ways. Now, there's a general sense that uh, selling, at least on a near-term basis, is overdone. But the problem is, at least for a lot of experts, they still want to see just a little bit more pain for individual investors. Now, of course, you always know when Wall Street is underperforming because they bring up those dastardly retail investors. Meanwhile, it's clear the backdrop for investing has changed. Now, what's not clear is what these adjustments are, how long we'll have to, you know, they'll be in place, and what you should be doing with your portfolio as a response. I want to bring in two of the very best, Phil Blancato, David Bonson are here. And David, I want to start with you. Are you in this camp that we've got to get one more crushing blow before we know it's all out and we can just waltz in and start picking up the pieces? That's been a, a standard deal for a lot of capitulations. But see, I really think this is more like 2000, where you're having a very secular transformation. And so I think that stocks that trade at 70 times earnings that come all the way down to 50 times do not meet my definition of cheap. I think it's entirely <laughs> possible. The Nasdaq didn't make a new high for 15 years after 2000. Right. I don't think we necessarily face that again, but there's no reason to believe that some of those tech things are all of a sudden cheap. It's not about the whole market. It's about the growth value dichotomy we've talked about. I've told you before, we're up on the year. That's healthcare, consumer staples, especially energy. I think it's because quality is going to do well for a while and poor quality has to wash out. That could take a while. Although we were we're still making new highs uh, for a long time as those 70, 70 PE stocks were getting crushed because yeah. they started getting crushed early in last year. Yep. But it was still those mega cap names that carry today. Uh, and so when it comes to something like that, uh, there's got to be a point when they're oversold, even if you think the rest of the junk out stuff out there is junk. So, so do you need to see them take another big hit here, Phil? No, but I do think you want to be mindful that some of the names you've always wanted to own are getting significantly cheaper. So you have an opportunity now. So you do you try to wait for them to get cheaper, even cheaper? Or do you start to say, okay, I'm going to start to nibble here since not picking the, the absolute not mob. Yet. Okay, not, not there, there yet. You've got two 50 basis point hikes probably in the next, call it 60 days. On the other side of those two hikes, July, I think is your opportunity to reenter growth because that's the chance to see inflation ebb, be on the other side, uh, the beginning of the Fed pausing, I think at least, and then you got a chance to re-enter the growth rally. So but the other, now, I'm still in value with David. So, so the other hot trade right now that everyone's talking about are dividends, right? <laughs> Goldman uh, out saying uh, you got to boost the boost of dividend growth uh, forecast for the year. This is another area you clearly were ahead of the crowd, David. Yeah, uh, since 1973. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. so how, how does it feel that the bandwagon is filling up? But I don't really like it, to be honest, because, yeah. because I like believing in this as a philosophy of investing capital, of free cash flow mattering, growing income mattering. The, Goldman actually called it a trade. I can't stand the idea of dividend growth being a trade because we believe in these companies as a higher quality way to capture equity market sure. return. Sure. Phil? Well, 71% of the time, owning the dividend in a rising rate environment is a winning trade. So we know history is on your side. And then as revenue contracts, dividends push higher because companies want you to own them. So they're willing to pay a bit more to keep you but in that trade. what's happened over the last, let's say, decade or so when buybacks have been the preferred way of returning capital to investors and those companies that buy back their stocks have seen, uh, you know, extraordinary gains? Well, it's because they were in the tech sector. The tech sector was doing well. But the fact of the matter is returning capital to shareholders of buybacks was a myth. They were funding employee compensation, executive compensation, stock options, stock grants. It was a Silicon Valley mechanism for the most part over 80 years you want to get capital back to shareholders dividends have been the best way to do it since the bush mm -hmm. tax cuts in 03 it's been even more tax efficient so i just think at the end of the day it is a dependable way you see uh, during covid the stock buybacks sure, up sure, and down sure. the dividend side much more particularly when you're focused on dividend growth much more stable i have a dividend letter as well and then the growth of it in the last year has been off the chain yeah. uh oppenheimer they like the banks here. Mm -hmm. They upgraded J, uh, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and SIVB. Uh, you, you were a, a bank buyer at some point. The yep. whole Finergy trade, Energy kept going up. Finergy it, it imploded. Yep. Is it time to buy them now? For sure. I, the, we got we to remember that. As the Fed pushes rates higher, not initially you're going to see a real tick up in revenue based on the earnings they get simply out of cash. They're loaded with cash right now. Don't forget, the first quarter is a lot about trading revenue hurting them. The second, third, fourth quarter is going to be about consumer lending. Consumer demand is improving. They still Corporate, lend to consumers? Uh, uh, they still do, especially <laughs> the regional banks. I like the, the regional bank trade for sure. But I do think you're going to see corporate revenue kip, kip, pick up, so okay. corporate borrowing kip up. I got to ask you both before this segment is over. Uh, we've got the Ohio primaries. We've got uh, that leaked SCOTUS uh, this, uh, on row. 
Uh, you, and of course, you know, we, we see now some of these polls where Republicans have the biggest lead ever over Democrats going into a midterm. What can the elections mean for the economy and the market? I'll start with you, David. Well, I think that uh, the margin by which the Republicans take back the House in November is going to matter because it will speak to 2024 likelihood. Um, I also believe it's going to be very telling in the Senate primaries where President Trump fits into some of this, because regardless of Ohio, I'm looking at Georgia, Pennsylvania. If some of his candidates do not win the primary, but the Republicans still do really well, that kind of opens things up and just speaks to not just a Trump MAGA environment, yeah. but a Republican right. environment, different and story. And the J.D. Vance thing, though, could be huge today as well. Uh, just 15 seconds. Will this help the market? Could this, if we do see a divided Washington, D.C., Republicans stop the Biden agenda, will that help the market? No, it will not initially. You'll see another little sell-off because of it. Traditionally, that's what happens. Really? Regional elections are a sell-off, usually down 70 percent. But off the September lows, we rally from there to 32 percent or more on average. So, Bill, David, I wish I had more time. You guys are great. And I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.